This is worship for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost on Sunday, November 15th, 2020. Welcome to worship for this 24th Sunday after Pentecost on Sunday, November 15th, 2020. I hope that you've all seen the invitation uh, for our Zoom coffee hour that's taking place today at 10 a.m. shortly after the service airs. If you haven't and there's still time, I hope that you'll contact me at home on my cell phone and I'll be happy to get you set up so that you can take part. It should be a lot of fun. I want to also let you know that TLC masks with our church logo and name on them are here. Information is available on, again, all our social media sites, and they're available for order um, and to, for pickup, either through online means or through the church office. I want you also to know that some traditions for the holidays continue. The giving tree is up. This year it's downstairs opposite the church office. There's plenty of tags, meaning there's plenty of young people that are in need of our help this Christmas. So I hope that you'll stop by the church and get a tag or two or three um, to make uh, someone's holiday a happy one. Lastly, the Who group is going to go through with the Christmas or cookie walk again. Um, after much talk, we've decided to do one through a drive through cookie walk this year. So no walking, just driving. And we're still hoping that all of you will bake cookies for this. There's a listing of what is needed. Um, an email is going out to that effect, and then information again in Barb's email every week will also be available for you. Um, this is really important work. Um, those cookies pay for all the ministries that the WHO group does in our name every year. Things like taking meals to those who are sick, to community outreach events like Backpack Blowout, Trunk or Treat, the Easter Egg Hunt, and so on. So. I really hope that you'll get your bake. What else are you going to do when you're inside but bake? So I hope you'll take advantage of that. Lastly, well, please watch for emails and Barb's email and others for information about our Advent and Christmas worship news. We have lots of opportunities for you to get involved this year in what we're putting together, the worship team. So I hope you'll take part to make this a special Christmas, even though it will be a little bit different than normal. With that being said, let's begin our worship. The call to worship. Clothe yourselves with faith and love. Be confident in your salvation in Christ Jesus. The Lord is with us. Let us worship God. The order for confession and forgiveness. God has not destined us for wrath, but for salvation in Jesus who died for us. Confident in God's mercies, let us confess our sin. Almighty God, you have shown us the ways of justice and nurtured us with love. Even so, we have not lived according to your will. When we are oppressed or unjustly accused, we cling to fear and forget to trust in your deliverance. When we are giddy with power and abuse, the rights of others, we hold tight to our privilege and forget your laws. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we are weak and prone to disobedience. Hear our confession and respond to us with kindness that we might turn to you again walk in the light and live in, in equity and peace through jesus christ we pray amen children of light because we belong to our lord jesus christ we need not fear for he lived for us he died for us he was raised for us and prays for us believe the promise of your baptism in jesus christ we are forgiven prayer of the day the Lord be with you and also with you let us pray O oh God the gift of your son is the life-changing treasure that is truly beyond all value 
Your generosity and goodness astound us. Inspire us to teach your commandments and share your gospel, that all may enter into the joy of Christ. Amen. is from 1st Thessalonians chapter 5. We don't need to write to you about the timing and dates, brothers and sisters. You know very well that the day of the Lord is coming, is going to come like a thief in the night. When they are saying there is peace and security at the time sudden destruction will attack them, like labor pains start with a pregnant woman that they definitely won't escape. But you aren't in darkness, brothers and sisters, so the day won't catch up you by surprise like a thief. All of you are children of the light and children of the day. We won't belong to the night or darkness. So then let's not sleep like the others, but let's stay awake and stay sober. People who sleep, sleep at night, and people who get drunk, get drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, let's stay sober, wearing faithfulness and love as a piece of armor that protects our body, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. God didn't intend for us to suffer his wrath, but rather to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So continue encouraging each other and building each other, just like you are doing already. The Holy Gospel appointed for this 24th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one he gave five talents, and to another he gave two and to another he gave one. He gave to each servant according to that servant's ability. Then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five talents took them and went to work doing business with them. He gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two talents gained two more. But the servant who had received the one talent dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward with five additional talents. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've gained five more. His master replied, Excellent. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will put you in charge of much. Come celebrate with me. The second servant also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. Look, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. Now the one who had received one talent came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid, and I hid my talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. His master replied, You evil and lazy servant. You knew that I harvest grain where I haven't sown, and that I gather crops where I haven't spread seed. In that case, you should have turned my money over to the bankers, so that when I returned, 
you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, take from him the talent and give it to the one who has ten talents. Those who have much will receive more and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even the little bit that they have will be taken away from them. Now take that worthless servant and throw him out into the farthest darkness. There people will be weeping and grinding their teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I love flowers. If you know me, you know that I, I truly adore flowers. Love is not too strong a word. There's something about their beauty that speaks to my soul. Probably a lot of it has to do with my love of God's good creation. God has given us so much to love and adore and to take care of. Believing and acting on our stewardship of creation is at the heart and core of my theological viewpoint. Out of that comes my concern for the people that God created along with all the flora and the fauna, which eventually leads me to flowers. And for me, the flowers are like little flourishes that God added at the end. I imagine God saying after looking at creation, yes, indeed. My creation is good. In fact, it's very good. But you know what's missing? The grace notes. The grace notes that will let my people know of my love for beauty and enjoyment of all things wonderful. For, flower, for me, flowers are sort of my love language that speaks to me of the joyful side of God. Which leads me to the beginnings of this sermon which you just watched. Those three amaryllis flowers. I'm amazed by the amaryllis flower. I truly am. Those are the beginnings of what are my annual Christmas amaryllis that I love to watch grow throughout the holiday season. I actually really wanted to focus in on and have you pay attention to those ugly brown dinosaur egg looking things that are the bulb from which the flower stems. Every year, I grow those three amaryllis on my counter, and the ones you're seeing in the video are actually the same ones that I grew last year. When they were done flowering after Christmas, I cut them down to the bulb, I stuck them in a paper bag where they've laid dormant until just a few days ago. When I took them out, put them in the light, and added a bit of water. And look what they've done in just about four days. They've actually grown about five inches so far. And I love to see them grow on their long, graceful stalks, seeming up to the heavens, where they will eventually bloom in glory. It's amazing. When I think of my faith and living it out in the world, I want to be like an amaryllis flower, adding the light of Christ to the waters of my baptism, and my faith flowers in glory to God. Except, I hate to admit it, my faith often doesn't. Honestly, I hold myself back. I fail to trust that I can do what Christ is calling me to do. I fail to live in the light of Christ. And I end up staying as an ugly little bulb and not the beautiful blossom that Christ has called me to be. Truth be told, I'm more like the third servant in the parable not like the first two. And truth be told, you're probably a little bit like that third servant too. So if that's true, is this parable a word of condemnation for us? I don't think so. I think it's actually a word of grace. 
Jesus is telling us in this parable to get over ourselves and to get going. Let's think a little bit more about what this parable is telling us. The master entrusts his three servants with talents. Now, these are not the talents that we think of. They are not skills and abilities, although that's a fair enough way to link this story to today. Many, many fine sermons have been written this way, encouraging us to use our talents and abilities to the glory of God. I know that I've personally preached that kind of sermon before, and there was no doubt I'll probably preach it again, but not today. So let's talk about those talents. Dr. James Howell notes that Jesus was talking about a talentum which was a coin that was the largest denomination of currency in that ancient world. We should translate talentum as a huge bucket of solid gold or a bank CEO mega bonus or winning the Ohio lottery or the Michigan lottery or the Powerball lottery. Only the muscular could, get, could even pick up a talentum which might weigh as much as 50 to 70 pounds. Each talenton was worth about one and a half million dollars in our economy today. And it was equal, as you can tell, to maybe 20, 30 years of wages or more. Howell explains it this way. This amount of money would stagger any recipient and send him utterly into uncharted territory. A Mediterranean laborer wouldn't have a clue about how to invest five talents up. Jesus, who had never personally seen that kind of money, used an outlandish hyperbole to symbolize the gospel. What value would Jesus attach to the gospel? It is the pearl of great price. It is like the Torah of old, more precious than gold. You sell all that you have and you don't notice the door slamming behind you as you sprint after Jesus. So these three servants, also translated in many ways as slaves, receive their various number of talents and the first two get right to work investing and really getting into the whole spirit of the whole thing. Now, my daughter Hannah is dating an investment advisor who deals with clients who have extremely large financial resources. So I thought I'd ask him about investing. As we talked, one thing became clear to me. He gets clients to work with him by convincing them to buy into the idea of him and his investment strategy. There's no question that many, many financial investment analysts, other ones, are always vying to handle his clients' portfolios. But they pick him. Specifically, they pick him because they believe in him and what he's offering to them. They invest their money with him because they buy into him and what he's promising to do for them. Do you buy into Jesus? Do you buy into what he promises to do for you? That will make all the difference in how you do your investing. That third slave who managed to take that big old coin and get it buried into what was obviously a fairly large hole was following actually pretty sound business practices. Because there weren't banks or safes back then, the safest way to keep and shelter your money was by burying it in the ground, where it would never actually see the light of day. You see, the problem for the third slave was, or servant, was that he didn't buy into his master. When questioned about why he failed to invest his one talent, the third slave said he hid it because he was afraid afraid of his master. He didn't buy into what his master was really giving him, although the master had graciously entrusted him with incredible wealth. The very act of leaving him with that kind of wealth was, in and of itself, a really incredibly gracious act. Yet the third slave still feared his master. 
Did you notice? He ultimately received the very kind of master he believed his master to be. He believed in the darkness of the master, and he himself was sent to the darkness in the end. So what kind of master, what kind of God do you believe in? I have come to know many people in my ministry that believe in an angry, gotcha kind of God. A God who cannot wait to catch us in the act of some great sin or moral failing, all so we can be sent to the farthest reaches of hell for eternity. So many, too many of God's children have learned that this is who God truly is. And I have to say, this is a God who makes absolutely no sense to me and drives me just a little bit nuts. Why would God create me? Why would God create us out of love and then look for opportunities to banish us away? It makes absolutely no sense. Yet that is the God that many people have known. And sadly, too often, that is the same God that way too many reject. In Tennessee Williams' provocative play, The Night of the Iguana, the lead character is actually a defrocked minister by the name of Reverend Shannon. At one point in the play, he rants and raves about the kind of God that many people believe in, and he says this. They think of God as this angry, petulant old man. I mean, he's represented, represented like a bad-tempered, childish, sick, peevish man. The sort of old man in a nursing home that's putting together a jigsaw puzzle and can't put it together and gets frustrated at it and kicks over the table. Yes, I tell you, they do that. All of our theologies do it. Accuse God of being a cruel, senile delinquent. Now, William Barclay was one of the great biblical scholars of the 20th century. I have all his commentaries that I inherited from my dad, I might add. Barclay was a very faithful and devout teacher with a God-given ability to communicate in the very language of lay people. Barclay developed a reputation as being something of a theological liberal. One day, Barclay lost his daughter and her, his son-in-law in a tragic boating accident. They had been sailing off the coast of Northern Ireland when a sudden storm came up and drowned both of them. After the funeral, Barclay received an anonymous letter from a woman who called herself a Christian. I know, she said, why God killed your daughter. It was to save her from being corrupted by your heresies. Well, Barclay couldn't reply to this letter because the woman hadn't signed her name. But he once remarked that if he could have answered, he would have said this. If that is the kind of God that you believe in, then your God is my devil. The day my daughter was lost at sea, there was sorrow in the very heart of God. Albert Bootser recalls leading a reading about a woman who grew up fearing God. It's one thing to possess a little bit of what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord. That means all respect, reverence for God. And that is a good thing. But this woman actually feared God. She once said to her pastor, you preach about God from the pulpit. Every week you encourage us to believe. You urge us to trust God with our lives. I wish I could do that, but I can't. The God I learned about as a child is not the friend you make God out to be. My God is an awesome figure who frightens me to death. In God's presence, I feel more condemned than forgiven, more judged than loved. How can I put my trust in someone who makes me feel like that? Many people cling to such images of God. The angry old man in the nursing home who kicks over the jigsaw puzzles that we construct out of our lives. 
the vengeful God of the self-righteous who zaps those who think outside the bounds of a particular theology, the fearful God who frightens us to death. When I think of God that way, it seems to me that in many ways we fear that God is actually just like us. Who when we don't get our way, and God certainly doesn't get God's way with us a lot of the time, God will respond exactly like we do, with anger and petulance. But we know better, right? Well, at least we should know better. For we know a God who responds with love. We know a God who dared to risk it all to invest in us with the life of his son. What, no, what more do we need to know about God's investment strategies? In fact, Jesus told this parable in the very last days of his life, when he would invest all creation with his very life's blood and overcome the forces of death and the darkness so that we might live and prosper in the light. As I stand here in the pulpit today, and I look out at all these empty pews. My mind always goes to images of you. I know so well who sits over there, who sits back there, who sits up front here. And I see you always sitting in those usual spots and I talk to you. Right now, today, I'm seeing Angela and Lucy Gossett sitting right up there in the front with Mary Ellen right next to them and sometimes Lynn and Scott and Stacy too. And I'm thinking that right after this sermon, we'd sing this little light of mine. And as always, Angela and Lucy would sing that song with their hands up in the air like this, letting their light so shine to beat the band. Well, I suggest we let our light shine as our own investment strategy. Take the light of Christ that gives our life meaning and worth, and let's invest that light in the world. Let us all bask in the light of Christ, and may our own lives soar towards the heavens as we grow in both faith and love. And in the end, may that love flower and bloom in the riches of our witness to the one who gave us life and calls us to a shared ministry through the Holy Spirit. Amen. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. respond to God's word by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And now the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, O God of hope, Awaken us to your new world. Your coming is the dawn of a new day that brings hope and healing to our lives. Fill your church with the light of your love that we may be still and know that you are God and stand in wonder of your majesty. O God of hope, Awaken us to your new world. We pray for all leaders and people of the world that division would end and that together we will stand against the powers and principalities of injustice and work together to build your reign of peace. O God of hope, awaken us to your new world. Rouse us to live in this present age in light of your hope for your return. Inspire us to encourage each other as we face this virus to press harder than we think we can work towards solutions that will bring health and healing, O God of hope. Awaken us to your new world. We pray for all who yearn for your light to break forth in places of sickness, toil, or danger, that we may find your way to your glorious realm through our love for one another. O God of hope, Awaken us to your new world. We pray for all who yearn for your light to break forth in places of sickness, toil, or danger. We pray that your presence be with Lynn, Dorothy, Bob, Nancy, Mary, and Lynn. May your healing hand be upon Tammy, Jay, Jerry, Pat, Jenny, Todd, Tammy, James, Debbie, Dennis, Joe, Bill, Levi, Jen, Jerry, Louis, and Dan. We pray that we may find vision of your glorious realm through our love for one another. O God of hope, awaken us to your new world. Give us the courage to acknowledge human frailty, limitation, and even death with confidence in your eternal plan, for we dwell forever in the light with you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. My God, whose coming we eagerly await, keep you fervent in faith, steadfast in hope, and constant in love and the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Encourage one another and build each other up, faithfully working together for the kingdom of God as we await the day of Christ's coming. Thanks be to God.